Hi, I'm Ken Jordan. I am the editor of Reality Sandwich, and I'm speaking with Jeffrey Martin, who is the man behind the Finders course, which is an extremely exciting uh, new program that has come about as a result of into states of non-dual consciousness, as I understand it. And uh, the uh, ability that he's now, you know, coming to uh, really explore and expose uh, that all of us have to achieve these, these states of higher consciousness, in you know, more traditional terms, um, uh, by learning techniques that anybody can access and develop with the proper training without um, much of the religious dogma that has often encapsulated these techniques uh, throughout millennia. Uh, it's very exciting work and I'm really pleased to be here with Jeffrey um, so that he can explain a little bit more to me and to all of you about the work that he's doing and where it's heading. Uh, so Jeffrey, thank you very much for joining me here today. Thank you, Ken. That was a great introduction. I'm glad, I'm glad you appreciate it. Uh, thank you for figuring out all the intricacies of Google Hangouts so that we could do this. <laughs> um, so why don't you start by, uh, by sharing with us uh, the work that you've done that has led up to the Finders course. Absolutely. So for the last eight plus years, really nearly almost the last decade, We've been exploring worldwide, literally six continents, over a thousand official research subjects, but thousands of unofficial people that we interact with really all the time. On any given day, I'm talking to many people who experience what we call persistent non-symbolic experience, but is publicly known by terms like enlightenment, non-duality, persistent mystical states, um, unit of states, union with God, or union with the divine, or union with nature, transcendental consciousness, things like that. So our term for it is persistent non-symbolic experience, which we often shorten to PNSE, so that our conversations don't take days. Uh, and over that last eight years, essentially what we've done is collect a ridiculous amount of data from these people. Now, the data we've collected is psychological and cognitive science based and originally the project was done really to sort them so that neuroscientists could scan them with fMRI and could look at them with EEG and MEG and other types of technologies and really try to determine what's going on in the brain, what's going on in the nervous system. That lasted up to about 2010, 2011 and after that we had a really, really good picture not only of the qualitative data but we think also of the neuroscience. So then we began working on technology in this area, trying to ask ourselves, you know, can we produce um, brain states? Can we basically get to these brain states by using brain stimulation technologies or by using neurofeedback technologies? And what we so wound up just just to understand that a little bit uh, in, in a little bit more detail. Mm -hmm. What kinds of practices were you examining? Was it, I'm assuming it's meditation? Did you um, people it, it, who are doing certain kinds of yoga? Did you ex examine people who were perhaps um, working with entheogens in some kind of, uh, um, you know, sort of an enhanced state because of something that they may have consumed? I mean, what were the range of subjects that you really were looking into? Our subjects weren't method-based so much as they were claim and culture and ideology and belief, if you will, based. And so rather than someone saying, you know, well, I'm a yoga practitioner and I've been practicing for 30 years or whatever, um, what we were looking for are people who purported a shift, a fundamental shift essentially in who they are towards these types of directions, towards enlightenment, if that was the term that their tradition used for it, towards non-duality, if that was the correct term, whatever. Initially, we started off with people who were validated by a community of some kind. So, you know, venerated teachers in traditions, that type of thing. But as the research project went on and the data was uh, very homogenous, essentially, we were able to then include people who were just, you know, programmers in Nebraska or who was a small business person in New Jersey. And those are the people that we actually found much more interesting 
because you know they weren't out there teaching it. They didn't have a certain type of thing that they were trying to sell or um, that they were trying to convince you of from an ideological or belief standpoint. So the when you talk about the finders course, for instance, the all of the methods that rose to the top of those interviews is essentially what constitutes the finders course. So last year we put together an experiment because the brain stimulation and the neurofeedback technologies they're a ways off um, and we really wanted to get to a point where we could, where we could collect data on people before and after this fundamental shift occurred for them up to that point really we'd only been able to collect data on people who had been in it at least a year persistently in one of these types of ways of experiencing the world for at least a year that was our cutoff so we had no data basically about who they were before it or what came before it so getting kind of an AB research design was super important to us and when it became clear that technology after really really giving it a go for a couple of years that technology just needed some time to catch up um, then we went back to the data which included the stuff that these people had used, all of the practices and methods and things like that, that these folks had been using in order to actually get them to that place. The thing that was originally, incredible... you, were, originally you were working with different types of uh, biofeedback or visualization tools, um, EEG readers, that kind of thing. Like, can you explain a little bit more about the technology that you were originally exactly. exploring? And we're still really working hard on that. Um, so that's still a huge initiative of us. We've just founded uh, the Transformative Technology Lab at Sophia University in the Valley. We've been working very hard on getting all the consciousness hacking meetups and all of that kind of stuff going. Um, and so really sort of worldwide we're trying to pull together a technology community around all of this. Um, so it did involve, you know, just to G based say, neurofeedback. Just say, I'm sorry, Jeffrey, just to say that the assumption is that the technology can, if you attach a device to yourself, it can help to lead you into a, um, what you were calling, a, you know, sort of the state of higher consciousness, right? Or a, a, a persistent non-dual state, right? Right. You know, exactly. and, that, and that's, that, you know, that's the hope. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, Although but you're I finding that the technology itself is not yet ready, is not yet at the level that you expect it to become uh, in order to, for it to be helpful in that way. That's right. We're really you know, working with people all over the world trying to push the envelope of it. Um, folks that are working on the, on the cutting edge of all of these technologies. And it might not necessarily even be something that leads you there, like an EEG type technology where you're sort of guided in with some sort of biofeedback. It may be a direct brain stimulation technology. Um, so we've experimented with all of those as well, and now we're, you know, interfacing with the people who are doing the very latest generation and type of that technology. But again, we think it's a little ways off. And so what you were finding is that, in fact, the traditional lineages that had been teaching people uh, practices that they could develop over time in order to achieve these states uh, were, in fact, actually effective and you could start to see a, a measurable shift in somebody's um, I mean how would you measure it actually I'm curious how, how did how could you determine by looking at the data whether somebody was sort of in a higher state of consciousness the easiest way for us to do it over time was to develop a set of questions that you could only properly answer if you were there in other words, you know, the answers weren't anywhere. You couldn't read them anywhere. Um, they weren't anywhere. You know, we weren't presenting them at academic conferences or writing about them or anything like that. So literally, when I sat down with you, if you answered the question a certain way, then we knew that you were part of this population. Now, those questions and those answers and all of that really sort of emerged from the earliest. Uh, research with the venerated spiritual teachers and religious teachers and and things like that. That's by far the easiest and quickest way. And then of course we've developed um, measures that we put those questions into as well. And we did do quite a bit of physiological measurement, quite a bit of um, recording of different different aspects essentially of the people's physiology. But certainly the shortest, quickest, simplest, easiest way is to just see if they know how to answer the questions correctly. 
uh, along the lines that all of those other people have, you know, those thousands of other people who are like, oh yeah, that totally nails it. But so, but these in these lineages, I mean, you know, they they advise you to really attain the highest levels that the practices uh, make available to you. That it could take decades of sitting in a cave in the Himalayas, you know, naked, covered in dust, you know, starving yourself in order to get to a certain point of achievement, right? And what, how, how is it possible that, that somebody could uh, come to some, a similar kind of state, you know, while not leaving their job in Nebraska and still, like, you know, picking up the kids from school? Right, exactly. What we learned is that there's essentially two key secrets to this. And I don't think you could really detect them until you had a study like ours that went across so many different cultures and belief systems. And although I keep talking about spirituality and religion, it's important to know there's a lot of atheists, a lot of agnostics that also experience this, that really aren't part of a tradition. There's lots of sort of different ways that this happens to people. It's not just people who are trying to get there. Sometimes it happens from the depths of depression and, you know, a switch just flips, for instance, is another way. Um, so the two keys, essentially, that shook out of this qualitative, this non-technological side of the research really were that there were only a relatively small number of methods that really seemed to work for more than just either no one or the tiniest, tiniest fraction of people. And I think that's a big surprise, right? That was a huge surprise for us. If you go to Google and you search on, you know, meditation or, you know, whatever, pick your pick your practice that you're wanting to get into, there's just millions and millions and millions of hits and ideas and everybody has their own thing about, well, it's worked for me and it's going to work for you kind of thing. Um, so the most amazing thing to us is that really there was a relatively small number of categories that actually did seem to work for these folks. So that was so, the so just, secret. Just understand, just understand that what you're saying, yeah. you're just suggesting is that the practices that a Jesuit monk and a Peruvian shaman and a, a, a Hindu seeker uh, all were using, even if they're apparently quite different on the surface, mm -hmm. you're suggesting that they're actually quite similar. Not quite. Um, no? There are similar things that go across multiple traditions, but the the it actually gets to the second sort of the second major finding or sort of the second sort of secret that emerged from all of this, and that is that not only do you have to find the needle in the haystack methods that work, and I think a lot of traditions have done that. So a lot of these spiritual traditions, religious traditions, they've been, you know, uncovering these and perfecting them and whatnot for years. And yet, even within those traditions, a relatively small number of people find them effective. So it turns out that the second piece of the puzzle is that you have to not only find that needle in a haystack method, but you have to find the method that works for you right now. So just because you know a list of the methods that are most likely to work and that seem to sort of be the most powerful methods, it doesn't mean that a large percentage of those methods are going to be working for you at any given time. So to give you an example of how this emerges from a research standpoint, um, essentially think of it like this. You want to be, you know, you want to get enlightened or you want to learn, you know, you want to transition into non-duality or whatever it is that you're interested in. So you go online and you search on the internet uh, and there's all the stuff that you're bombarded with and probably eventually you give up and you just ask a friend who has a similar interest or you take your best guess. Um, one of a few things is going to happen for you at that point. So the stories of the participants go like this. Either you're going to get, you know, remarkably lucky and the very first thing that you try is going to be a home run for you it's going to be a method that works really well and it's going to be a method that's ideally matched to you right now in this moment. If that's the case, you're probably going to tell us that you woke up pretty quickly. Could have been within a week, could have been within a few days, could have been within a few months, but it's rapid. Now the second option is that maybe you find a technique 
And it doesn't work, but there's some, some lore, if you will, around that technique, which is that this is the only technique that really works. And if you just keep practicing this technique, eventually it'll work for you. If you buy into that lore, then you're going to be reporting a couple of different paths. The first is that you may eventually kind of psychologically or developmentally come into alignment with that method. So now, you know, you're not waking up in three months or six months or three days or whatever. Maybe you're waking up in 30 years or 40 years or 15 years or, you know, seven, eight years, something like that. So you're, you're on the long road. If at some point your psychological development matches and comes into alignment later in your life, just because of who knows why, just the changes that are occurring for you, um, that method may eventually work for you and it may eventually wake you up. And so you see this in traditions, for instance, that advocate a single method. Some people wake up like lickety-split. I mean, they're in the initiation ceremony and they wake up, you know. Other people, they practice this stuff for decades and decades and decades, and, you know, 50 years in, um, finally, they wake up. M many, many people never wake up because that method was just never going to come into alignment with them. So it kind of depends on the range of techniques that uh, that if you're in a tradition, if you're in a religion or a spiritual tradition, it sort of depends on how many of these, if you will, greatest hits techniques are actually encapsulated in some way within the tradition. Some of them, like mantra-based stuff, I mean, that basically cuts across everything. Pretty much no matter what tradition you fall into, it's going to have some sort of mantra-based practice. And that is one of the ones that sorts to the top of the list. There's different ways of doing it. There's some complexity there. But essentially, it sorts to the top of the list. So you can be in almost any religious or spiritual tradition. Um, and if you luck out and mantras wind up being the thing that's aligned to you, um, then you're in luck. But probably, you know, your five or ten other friends who have been trying mantras, they're, gonna, they're just going to keep trying and trying and trying and trying, and many of them it will never work for. And some of them maybe will come into alignment with it at a later point in their life. So the third path is, you know, you try something, you maybe find some sort of meditation technique, and you try it, and, it, you know, you give it a week or two or a month or whatever, and it doesn't seem to really be doing anything for you. And then you start the search again. You know, you start looking again. So this is a third type. Um, of person, sort of a third type of report in the study. And, you know, if, then you're back to that matching process. And so obviously the people in the study, you know, they, they woke up, so they eventually found things, whether it was the second or third or tenth or ten millionth thing that they tried. Um, they, have, they did eventually find something that worked for them. So essentially those are the paths. And what we were thinking in looking at this is, well, we, we seem to have you know, the first list of the greatest hits, if you will. Um, I wonder what happens if we just have people start doing these. So we, we started experimenting with how long did you really have to do something in order to tell whether or not there was a positive effect or maybe there was a negative uh, effect, you know. It's not, everything isn't necessarily a positive impact from these. You can be out of alignment just like you can be in alignment. Usually what happens is something just doesn't work for you, but sometimes people have very negative experiences. Um, and what we determined was that pretty much in a week, with diligent practice for at least an hour a day, you could tell at the end of a week whether or not you were in alignment with one of these. So then we just thought, how well, let's just... Practices, how many practices... Did you catalog like this? Was it a dozen, or is it a hundred, or is it three? I mean, I'm trying to get a sense of what what's the range. Right. You really, we really think um, so far, based on our research, that the top six apply to just about everybody, and hmm. so the finders course essentially incorporates six techniques, um, and so you know we just have people work through them one a week, one after another. Now, there, there is, you know, it's not that simple, right? There's a ridiculous amount of research complexity that's yeah. under the hood of this thing. We try to make it look very simple, you know, if you're participating in the course slash experiment. Uh, we think of it as an experiment, but of course it's put out there as a course for people. Um, so, for instance, um, it's not six weeks. You might think to yourself, oh, well, then it's a six-week course. But some of those methods that sort to the top I, they have sort of an issue with them for some people. And you may or may not have heard of the phenomenon of dark nights, right? But there's this phenomenon 
Uh, and it's actually being researched academically now. It's really wonderful. Willoughby Britton at Brown University has a lab and a center, and she's doing a lot of work on this. And she's really the first one to really try to dig into it um, in a very meaningful psychological neuroscience kind of way. Uh, so a couple of these techniques, they're known for producing dark nights in certain percentages of people that try them. So obviously we didn't want to run an experiment where we might be messing people up for three months or three weeks or three days or three years or three decades. I mean, these things can really go on. Uh, and so we had to take some time and we really sort of looked into what we could do to mitigate dark nights. Uh, and, that, and that led to us actually having to add six weeks before the other six weeks. So the course winds up being 15 weeks. There are six weeks which are primarily designed to get you into essentially a psychological sweet spot, if you will, so that you don't dark night in the second half of the course. Um, and then there's a, there's, there's a sort of a practice intensive between the first six weeks and the second um, six weeks. And then uh, in the second six weeks, we actually expanded it to seven weeks because we found a period where after you'd learned a series of techniques, it was very beneficial to give people a week to really kind of dig in on those techniques and which ones were most powerful. A lot of, basically, it seemed to be one of those points where, you know, people were waking up a lot at that point in the course. And so we felt like, you know, that was a good time to give them some extra time to deepen, to, to see if that, to basically allow the maximum amount of shifts for the maximum amount of people from that classification of techniques before we moved on with the rest of so the course. So waking up, when you say, when you say waking up, mm -hmm. what are people reporting? Is their experience of that being woken up? Well, I tell you, uh, that's one of the greatest things about my job in this research is that every single week people fill out a uh, an evaluation form. Essentially, we use academic measures, many many gold standard academic measures at the beginning, middle, and end of the course. Uh, but each week we have a tracking measure, and one and we ask them literally that question in a couple of different ways. You know. Uh, and I think the, the really fascinating thing for me has, first of all, I would have, you know, I'm probably the world's leading academic expert on persistent non-symbolic experience at this point, and I would have bet everything I had against this kind of rapid transition to persistent non-symbolic experience being possible. So, I mean, that was a huge, I'm still in a little bit of disbelief about it, even though now we've had so many people make that transition. Um, so to put that in... In the more traditional terms, that yeah. is, somebody to hold that they are able to do a med to meditate and clear their mind and be full of free of thought. They are feeling something in their body. They're feeling a connection to light in a certain way. What I mean, what is how you know? Are they growing wings and flying out the window? I mean, what are they? <laughs> what are, what's actually happening? Right? They're really shifting into. Um, persistent states, right? So you're, so we're talking about sort of a persistent, ongoing way that reality is experienced in the same way that when we sat down with people who in their tradition might call themselves enlightened or in another tradition might call themselves non-dual or persistently mystical or whatever. Those are basically the places that are being reached. In our research, we classified uh, a number of different types of those experiences. So we determined essentially that there's a continuum of those and they change depending on a number of underlying factors so that there's different there's differences in cognition and th in thoughts and thinking basically there's differences in emotion there's differences in how memory shows up uh, there's differences in, in perception um, but these cluster in different ways so along the continuum we say you know some a research participant reporting enlightenment might be in location one for instance on our continuum or they might be in location three or they might be in location four so there's these there's different ways, if you will, that this experience shows up. And the other big surprise out of the course, I mean, the huge surprise was that we were expecting to track people for years. You know, we thought we'll be collecting data on these people. Maybe one of them will wake up eventually, that kind of thing. Um, but so the surprise, aside from the fact that of this sort of rapidity of waking up, I would say there were two other things. The first is that they landed all across that continuum. So some of them woke up in location one, some of them in location two, some of them in location three, some of them in location four. So they really represented the whole breadth 
of what was possible within the within this experience that you know publicly might be thought of as enlightenment experiences or non-dual experiences or whatever. Uh, okay. between one location, three location. I mean, these different locations. I assume there's different sort of clusters of experience. Exactly. You know, some people are maybe more in touch with guides, perhaps, or sort of having some kind of auditory connection or visual connection to something outside the self. Others might be able to hold a kind of um, that sort of clear, just sort of compassionate, being a very particularly compassionate place. I guess. I mean, I'm just sort of having not really. Sure. A, a, don't really understand what, you're, but I'm assuming it's this kind of thing where you're 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 again looking at these lineages and comparing among the various lineages where there's some commonalities between people who have attained certain different states and sort of grouping them together into these four different locations, as you're calling them. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. And looking, okay. and we're, we look deep under the hood with our cognitive science questions that we're designed to essentially sort for you know neurological measurement um, so we, we really only asked questions if you wanted to talk to us about how your awareness felt or whatever else we, you didn't get away with that with us very long we were asking questions directly about changes in cognition emotion uh, perception memory sense of self things like that really you know rigorous sort of hardcore cognitive science psychology type questions and that's what was that's what made us successful frankly is that we were able to get under everybody else's language and so where you know if you were to just interview all of these folks and you were to allow them to speak about this in the way that they were used to speaking about it they all sound like totally different you know from each other but um, because we were just not allowing them to use their own words, not allowing them to speak from their own belief systems or the normalized ways that they learned to talk about in their community and really forcing them to dig down in. That's why nobody had the answers to our questions. You know, we, there are people that had had thousands and thousands of students asking them questions over decades, right? And yet when we would ask them our questions, they'd be like, hmm. You know, they'd have to stop and think about it. Like nobody would ever asked them that before and so you know if you were to actually listen to the interviews that we do there's these you know, there's a question and then most often like a long gap <laughs> while the person is kind of feeling around for how they're going to answer it and then an answer and then another question then a long gap and, and it's really it's it's amazing if you think about the fact that it had just never sort it had never been tackled in that way before and so that's really was the secret sauce that made it all work you know, there's one other thing that I would say that was a that was a really neat finding from this research protocol, from what we're publicly calling the Finders Course, and that is that it also allows people to get back to experiences. So I think one of the most heartening things for me to have heard is, you know, someone who was looking out at a beautiful landscape 40 years ago, and they just had this amazing unitive experience and you know it, it changed them but for decades basically they've been wanting to experience that again and nothing that they've ever done has worked um, all the way up to people who would have you know um, religious experiences along those lines or just kind of whatever one of the other really super cool things about the course is um, it seems to provide a kind of a regularity of access to those types of things for those people again uh, and in fact we're learning we collected a lot more data week to week this time than we did the first time um, I mean again the first time we thought we were going to be collecting data for years right we didn't expect people to be waking up in the course so it wasn't structured for that this time we could you know we could structure the data collection with the expectation that at least some people might wake up in the course and one of the interesting things that we've learned in this particular run of it is that um, it's it's very common for people to have temporary experiences of this before they have a persistent shift over to it before it becomes sort of the default operating mode in the world and um, it does seem like oftentimes there's a frequency that happens you know they, it happens more and more and more like maybe it'll be happening like four or five six times throughout the day for instance um, or if it's not showing up like that, maybe it's happening once or twice a day, but those, those periods are getting much, much longer than the initial glimpse. Um, so there, there's, there's kind of an interesting sort of sinking in process that we're seeing and learning about as well. Fascinating. Before we close up, because we're now we're 
afraid we're running out of time. Um, it does seem a question I have is what you develop and the approach that you take um, suggests that whether it, whether it actually has to take a position on whether the experience that people are having is uh, all internally generated and cognitively experienced you know through neurology or whether there's an actual spiritual encounter with something outside of the self it seems that you can actually it's from the way you're describing it that the program is actually relatively agnostic about that distinction is that fair that's exactly right it, it's completely agnostic about that distinction and in interviewing people that go through it um, religious people and this incidentally matches the findings from um, all of the previous research that we did um, religious people will often report uh, that when the experience settles in for them in a persistent way when they do get to that persistent state of non-symbolic experience um, it very often does have you know that feeling of divinity or God or whatever flavor they've absorbed if you will from a belief system or an ideological standpoint and conversely if you're coming to the course and you're an atheist um, you know one of the standard things that goes along with this type of way of being is that you often feel much more connected you feel like you extend beyond your body things like that well that can show up in a sort of a divine presence sort of way but for an atheist or an agnostic often it shows up as a connection to nature or as a connection to all that is or a sense that everything is consciousness sort of more of a panpsychist uh, type of notion and what we've seen in the course is that essentially regardless of which side you fall on um, th those things both emerge from these underlying changes that are produced by going through this protocol it's really really quite fascinating that's great thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today Jeffrey I really appreciate it um, my understanding is that the next uh, round of the finders course is going to be happening sometime early in 2015. The very next run of it is actually coming up on November 14th. November 14th? Oh, very yeah. soon. <laughs> no, it didn't really go soon as soon. Yeah, okay. you know, it's, I'm spending my weekend getting it ready. <laughs> it's that close, yeah. essentially. As and people can take part in this uh, online, right? It's not necessarily, you don't have to be, in, it's not an in-person uh, experience. You can do this uh, remotely from your desktop. Exactly. It's, right. it's, it's all online. It's practice, not theory driven. So there's a short instructional session once a week, and then you basically go off and do as you're asked for the remaining week, which people can find out about it at finderscourse.com if they're interested. That's, okay, very cool. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we look forward to talking with you again about this at uh, some point in the relatively near future. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you very much. It was really great.